We've completed a, uh, a quick review of the book of Daniel so far, and we've discussed the main interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the subsequent visions that Daniel has uh, that give a lot more detail concerning the uh, meaning of his dream. And remember, I keep repeating this thing over and over again. If you're going to understand Daniel, understand that it's about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Okay? That's the key. The visions that he has after are just different versions of the original dream. And the different vi visions simply color in more detail concerning the dream, and the dream, of course, is the basis for the prophecies that he makes. So Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the other visions revealed that beginning with the world power that ruled while he was alive, which was the world power of Babylon, there would be a total of four world empires. Now during the fourth and last world empire in his visions, he saw a new spiritual kingdom would be formed by God that would replace these and then would remain forever. Now in some of his visions, Daniel said that at the beginning, the spiritual kingdom that would come would be in a great struggle with the fourth world empire. But the spiritual kingdom would eventually win out and be victorious. Now Daniel also prophesied about regional wars and events that would lead to the rise and the final collapse of the ancient kingdom of Judah and its capital Jerusalem, as well as the time frame for when the Messiah would come. So he had dreams about the four kingdoms and he also had visions about what took place in between the kingdoms to give even more detail. That's why we we really look at Daniel's visions and Daniel's prophecies as a strong um, uh, basis for the uh, inspiration of scripture. It's not just some sort of nebulous idea that something might happen in the future. It's very, very specific and very detailed. History has shown that Daniel's visions and prophecies were indeed accurate. There were four great world empires that succeeded each other. Babylonia, the Medo-Persian Empire, Greece, and then of course Rome. And they were you know, in that particular order. During the Roman period, the Messiah was born and fulfilled His ministry. And the spiritual kingdom that Daniel talked about, which is the church, was established. When? During that fourth empire, the Roman Empire. And also the Jewish kingdom was destroyed. When? At that time, in 70 AD. We know historically that the Romans went into Jerusalem and destroyed the city and the temple and killed many of the people there. Most importantly, they destroyed the genealogical records with which the Jews could claim that they belonged to a certain tribe, especially the priestly tribe. So without the genealogical records, there was no proof who could be a priest, who could therefore offer sacrifice, and since their entire religion was built around that, the destruction of those records meant the destruction of their uh, religion. It was also during the Roman period that the church was persecuted, but eventually overcame this persecution to spread the gospel throughout the world. And so now, 2,000 years plus later, none of the world empires remain, but the spiritual kingdom, which is the church, continues to grow throughout the world exactly as Daniel prophesied. That stone that struck the statue at its base and the whole statue came crumbling down and then it is uh, in the dream, you know, the stone then grew into a mountain that filled the world. Well, that, that's the church. It started small during the fourth kingdom. There was a period of struggle, but then eventually the, the whole thing came crashing down. And what arose out of that? Well, the Christian church rose out of that. And, and, and for 2,000 years has continued to grow and fill the earth. Now you could almost say, so that was in the book of Daniel, so you could almost say that the book of Revelation is actually a continuation of the book of Daniel. In it, John the Apostle uses the same kind of apocalyptic language filled with imagery and symbolism to focus in on the struggle between the fourth world power 
and the spiritual kingdom that Daniel spoke of hundreds of years before. So we're going to start the book of Revelation tonight, and we're going to do the same thing. Don't have time to read every verse. This is not a textual study, but a, an overview. Uh, and uh, let's start with a bit of uh, background, shall we? Uh, let's look at the author date and place, some material that many of you are familiar with already. The book was written by John the Apostle. He names himself, and the fact that God uh, dictated to Jesus, who gave it to an angel, who spoke to John. That's how John describes the book you know, coming to him. Uh, it was the book of Revelation, that letter, was circulated among the churches in Asia Minor and it gained early acceptance by the entire church. So very early on, the church that existed at that time accepted that the book of Revelation was uh, inspired by God. Uh, John lived to an advanced age teaching and serving the church at Ephesus. Um, he was banished to the island of Patmos in the Roman persecution of Domitian in the year 94-95 AD. So he was, you know, the Ephesus was on the mainland of Asia Minor, Patmos was an island where they sent prisoners, so on and so forth. That's where uh, John was sent. And he was sent there to, to stop a lot of his influence because he was a leader in the church at the, at the time. Uh, so we know that it is in Patmos or at Patmos that he had the visions that he describes in the book because he talks about being there and having these visions. Uh, we know from history that he was released from exile in 96 AD and returned to Ephesus where he wrote the book of Revelation and circulated it first among the seven churches because that's the beginning of the book. It talks to the seven churches. So those first seven, those were actual churches that existed. Those first seven churches were the ones that received that letter, that book, at the beginning. Uh, and then, of course, it had a, a wider uh, circulation. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, Roman history. John the Apostle actually lived through three periods of Roman history persecution. When we talk about Roman persecution, it wasn't like you know, a constant thing that happened every year all the time for a you know, hundred years. It, it started and stopped. It started and stopped. It's, you know, it, was a, it was one of those things. There were periods, depending on who was the emperor, depending on what the politics were. So John the Apostle lived through three of these periods. First, through the um, persecution of Nero from 64 AD to 67 AD. Uh, Nero, of course, we know, uh, blamed Christians for setting fire to Rome, uh, something which he did, or he's suspected of doing. Uh, I've mentioned before in other classes that Nero was a, uh, he liked to build, and he had a great vision for new Rome, you know, and uh, he had a lot of projects, but he had to get rid of old buildings, you know, he had to get rid of the existing structures, and there was resistance, and so what he did was, you know, um, apparently he started a, the fire. And in order to move blame away from himself, he blamed Christians because they were a you know, disenfranchised group. Nobody liked them anyways. <laughs> and so it was easy. They were secretive and so on and so forth. And so uh, we're blamed for this. Uh, we know that Peter, the apostle, and Paul, the apostle, were martyred during this particular uh, persecution. Uh, Domitian, another um, um, persecution, uh, during the uh, reign of Domitian uh, from 95 to 96 AD. This was a very short uh, period of uh, persecution for the church, but it was vicious that it took over 40,000 Christian lives. Think about that. 40,000 Christians were killed, murdered during that time. And it was also during that time that John was sent to the Isle of Patmos. And then there, is the, uh, there was the persecution of Trajan uh, from 98 to 117 AD. So you see how I'm saying it starts, it stops, it starts, it stops. This happened after the book of Revelation was written. Uh, and Trajan was the emperor that promoted the emperor worship. Okay? Um, it was the last persecution experienced by John, but not the last persecution experienced by the church. 
There were eight other major persecutions of Christians by Rome, and the last one being the persecution by Diocletian in the year 284 to 305. So you see it starts in 60, 64, you know, the persecution, and, it, and, and they have eight rounds of persecution all the way into uh, the third or fourth century. And so when the book of Revelation is talking about be patient, you know, and there's persecution and it's vicious, you know, it wasn't just a six month thing. You know, it was something that was to last for many, many years, for several, for several centuries. When Constantine became emperor and was converted, Christianity became the state religion of Rome by the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. Some people say that was a great thing, some people say that was not a good thing because it was at that time that Christianity, which was you know, house churches and you know, things like that, began like that, independent churches, congregationalist style like we have now, uh, uh, began to transform into a more corporate looking thing, okay, which ultimately became uh, Roman Catholicism. John writes about the struggle between Rome and the church as prophesied by Daniel. He uses the same language of symbolism, but he does so to hide the meaning of the book from those who were attacking the church during his lifetime. Daniel used that language not to hide anything because the Babylonians, you know, they didn't care, you know what I'm saying? There was no issue there. He wrote with those terms, he used that language because it was a language that the Jews understood. It was you know, the, the type of literature that they, that they understood. John uses it uh, because it's language that the Jews understand and Christians understand, but he also uses it because at the time it was a capital offense to own the scriptures, to have any letters from the apostles because they were, the, you know, they were outlawed. And so he writes in this fashion so that the enemy, if you wish, the persecutors, will not be able to understand what he is uh, writing. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the content. Revelation is the only book in the New Testament that is completely devoted to, uh, to prophecy. Only book completely devoted to prophecy. It's, a, it's hard to understand because it is written, as I say, in a particular literary style called apocalyptic literature. I mean, the difference is, has anybody ever read you know, Shakespeare? I mean, Shakespearean English, Elizabethan English? You know, Pilgrim's Progress or any of the plays by Shakespeare as, it, as they were originally written, they're in English, but man, <laughs> they're pretty difficult to understand English. People take courses to understand the English of that time. Well, it's a little bit like that. You, know, you have to take a course almost to understand apocalyptic literature and symbolism to be able to understand what they were uh, what they were talking about. So some features of apocalyptic uh, literature. Usually it was uh, produced um, in times of persecution or suffering. Daniel, for example, right? They were, in, they were in captivity in Babylon, book of Revelation. These are not the only two places where they use this, by the way. Joel, the, uh, the prophet Joel uses it and others use it as well. But the two examples that we see the most, Daniel and Revelation. Um, it had an intense um, despair of present circumstances and it also had an intense hope of divine intervention in the future. You know, please God, please come to our rescue. You know, it, was in, it was an intense type of um, uh, writing. Uh, it used symbolic language, dreams, visions, uh, the writers also used um, celestial characters, demons, you know, to act out God's purpose in history. It's kind of scary when you read it. You know? I mean, it's like, it's, it's weird. Um, the wicked, in this type of writing, the wicked suffer catastrophic judgment. Not just you know, the firing squad or they go to prison. I mean, they are just cast in a, a lake of fire forever. You know, I mean, it's, the judgment is, is horrible. And the righteous, 
are saved in a supernatural way. Someone, an angel comes from heaven and you know, saves them. Now most ap uh, apocalyptic writing uh, used names of bibli biblical historical character as authors, you know, like the book of Enoch, for example. Um, all apocalyptic writings had these characteristics, including the book of Revelation. Uh, but the book of Revelation names its true author. It didn't have just, you know, John didn't stick a name of somebody else on it, he gave his own name. And he plays a part in the action of the book. So he writes in the book, he writes the book, and he's also part of the book, which is an interesting, uh, an interesting feature. Um, Rome and its past and future persecutions was the model for the book because most imagery of the enemy can easily be traced to Rome and its opposition to the church. If you know that, that's the key that kind of, you, you know, you're reading through the thing and you go, oh, oh yeah, oh, I get it now, I see who that is. You know? For example, the beast, you know, it talks about the beast with authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. I mean, who could that be in the first century? It could only be Rome. I mean, what, what power was there in the first century that had authority over all the nations? Well, Rome. There was no other power. Uh, the mark, you know, we'll read in Revelation, you know, the mark that everyone had to have, I'm not talking about a guy named Mark. I mean a mark, you know, bunk, a mark, bunk. You know, a mark that everyone had to carry in order to buy and sell. We read about that. Well, that correlates to the imperial seal. In that time, the imperial seal was necessary to be on all contracts, all licenses, all wills, all legal documents. You could not do business unless you had the imperial seal. It was a money maker, come on. You know, now, you, know, you want to put a shed in your back, uh, you, you want to put a shed in your backyard. What do you have to do? You have to go to City Hall and ask them permission to give you a permit so that you can do what? Put a four by six shed in your backyard to stick your lawn fertilizer, really? Why do they do that? Are they afraid that we will build sheds you know, that are 16 stories high? No, it's a money maker. You want a bicycle, what do you have to do? Well, you have to get a license for it. And so uh, you know, uh, various city governments get away with what they can you know, uh, until eventually the people rise up and say, hey, wait, that's enough, we'll vote you out. You know, city council says, all right, no more license for sheds. You know that councilor is getting elected. In Rome, you couldn't rise up. Rome said, if you're, if you're transporting anything, you're buying and selling anything, you have to have the imperial seal. And if they, didn't, and if they wanted to starve you out, if they wanted to disenfranch uh, disenfranchise you, you didn't get the seal. And guess who didn't get the seal? Well, Christian, a Christian businessman you know, was not getting the seal because part of the seal was also buying into the emperor worship and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. So anyways, the idea of the, the seal, who else did a thing like that in the first century? Rome, of course. And then he describes a, a Babylon, he talks about Babylon, but Babylon had been a, an empire that had disintegrated hundreds of years before. And yet he, uh, John describes Babylon and he says, she sits on seven hills. Well, of course, he refers to a wicked city surrounded by seven mountains. What other big city was surrounded by seven mountains in those days, other than Rome? There wasn't any. So there are a lot of thinly veiled references to Rome. Now, regardless of how people interpret it now, the book of Revelation was seen as, a, uh, as referring to the church's relationship with Rome when it was uh, first read in the first century. Uh, the point I'm, and we'll talk about this in a minute. You know, today people say, oh, Revelation, that's about the end of the world, and you know, the thousand year reign, and da da zee, and da da If you lived in the first century, and you were a Christian in the first century, okay, and you read the book of Revelation, you knew immediately that John was not talking about the end of the world. He was talking about Rome. 
and what was happening between Rome and the church. I mean, what good would that letter have been to anybody in the first century if it was only talking about the end of the world? I mean, you know. For them, they thought they were going through the end of the world. Now, I remind you that during the Second World War, a lot of people thought that uh, Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. They thought that was the end of the world, and that did seem like the end of the world, didn't it? The horrific things that were happening, and the entire world was at war, and you know. So, uh, it's about what's going on um, in the first century. So the warning and the encouragement was to stand firm against a pagan and totalitarian rulership that wanted to control and then destroy the religion of Christ and the faith in Christ. That's what the book is about. It was also a warning to Christians who were growing lax in their moral standards and becoming uh, you know, wavering in their faith. So the language and the symbols used come from the Old Testament and Old Testament imagery, which would be understandable to Christians, especially Jewish Christians, in the first century. The message is encoded in this way because of the persecution, so that the Roman authorities would not understand the content of the material that was mostly about them. The imagery and the symbols come mostly from Daniel and Ezekiel as well, so that an understanding of this material is necessary if the modern reader is to correctly interpret the book of Revelation. As I say, so many people don't even read Daniel, have no idea about Ezekiel, and they're going to explain to us what Revelation is about. That's why we started in Dan. If you don't get Daniel, you're not going to get the book of Revelation. And because the book is complex, there are many interpretations as to its meaning. There have been traditionally, these have been traditionally grouped into different schools of thought. And briefly, here are the schools of thought concerning the book of Revelation. The first one is called the Preterist. You might think, oh, that must be a mistake. It should be Peterist, but no, it's Preterist, the Preterist school. And the Preterist school believes that all the symbolism in the book of Revelation um, refers to the first century only. There's no, quote, prophecy to the end of the world in the book of Revelation. It's all about the first century. That's the Preterist school. Then there's the Idealist school. The Idealist school, for these uh, scholars, these people, the book of Revelation is non-historical. It simply symbolizes the ongoing struggle between Christ, His church, and the evil that's in the world. In other words, it's a parable. It's a kind of a, it's a, kind of a scary parable. And the book of Revelation simply describes what has happened throughout history. There's Christ and His, or throughout history from the beginning of the church. There's Christ and His church and the powers of evil always trying to destroy it, but the church will ultimately win out in the end. So it's just symbolism. It's not, there's no history in it at all. Okay, so we have the uh, Preterist school and the Idealist school. And some people wonder, well, what do we believe? And I'll explain the others in a, in a second. What do we in the churches of Christ, what's our position? Well, our position is actually a combination of the two. Our position is a combination of the two. We hold that John uses the struggle between Rome and the church as a model for the ongoing struggle which will go on throughout history and then end when Christ comes. So we don't say it's just about the first century and we don't say it's just a symbol. We say it's a combination of the two. Yes, it talks about what really happened in the first century, but what it explains will serve as a model for the church throughout history. Okay? The third school is the historist school. They believe that the book outlines the actual history of the world from Pentecost until the second coming of Jesus, and what they try to do is interpret world events throughout history and try to sync it up with what is happening in the book of Revelation. 
That's why you have people from time to time coming out saying, oh, the end of the world is now, you know, we've, we've done all the calculations. And so, well, they're part of the historicist school. They've calculated, oh, the beast, and you know, Russia's the beast, and China's the rising power, and the, the war is coming, and in 20 years there'll be two million people fighting in the valley, and so on. That's, that's those people. And then the futurist school, they believe the first three chapters refers to the first century, because those are the chapters where John is talking to the seven churches. So they believe the first three chapters refer to the first century and the churches that existed then. And then the other part of the book refers to a future event that they call, careful now, the Great Tribulation. You hear that? During the Tribulation. And the symbols describe what will take place then. Most evangelical, when I say evangelical, I mean uh, community churches, Baptist churches, you know, most evangelical churches and charismatic churches, Pentecostals, Church of God, and that. Their idea is one or the other. It's, they're either historicists or futurists or a combination of the two. Okay? So that's why when you're having a discussion with somebody and you're just talking about your thing and their thing and you're saying, why doesn't he understand what I'm saying? Well, because, I mean, they're working from a framework here and you're working from another framework. What I find many times in the church is that we don't know what our framework is. We don't know what we know. Like we know it, but we don't know what it is that we know. So I hope those of you who are here and those who are listening you know, will understand where are we coming from and why we believe what we believe? All right, another group of ideas regarding uh, Revelation are based on what the thousand years, because he talks about a thousand years, right? The thousand year reign. Uh, what does the thousand years in Revelation refer to? And there are three main millennial, thousand, right? Three main millennial views. And they are, first, what we call post-millennial. Post-millennial, uh, for a post-millennialist, the thousand years is figurative of a long period of time before Jesus returns. In their view, the gospel will finally win over all the nations and then there will be a period of peace and then Jesus will return. That's the post-millennial. A thousand years and then Jesus comes after that. You know, that's that's post-millennial. Then there's a millennial. The a millennial view says the thousand years is only figurative. You remember Jewish numerology we talked about? In Jewish numerology the number 10 refer to something which was mature or perfect. I don't mean perfect like not a single flaw. I mean perfect as in ripe. Okay? A tomato is ripe. It might have a little lump on it, but it's ripe. It's ready for picking. Okay? So the number 10 referred to you know, something that was right, something that was complete, the Ten Commandments. Okay? So you have 10, times 10, times 10, that gives you a thousand. That's like something which is so mature, so ripe, so you know, perfectly done. And it refers to something that only God knows, because only God knows when something is that ready. Okay? So for a millennial, thousand years is only figurative. But Jesus will return at any time, and when He does, everything will end. There will be a new heaven, a new earth will be created, and the millennial, the thousand years, is it's now. We're in the thousand years. We're in that time. It's the time between the establishment of the church and the return of Christ. Now, here's where the idea of you know, the perfect, you know, does the Bible say when Jesus will return? No, even Jesus says no one knows. Only the Father knows, right? Only the Father knows 10 times 10 times 10, that perfect time. 
Only the Father knows that time. We're living in the millennial age now. It's not a thousand, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's a time period that only God knows and the only instruction we have for that time period is be ready, be ready, okay? And then of course there's pre-millennial. Now the pre-millennial is what gets all the publicity. That's what all the books are written about. That's what all the TV, you know, the made for TV movies are made of or the movies that go directly to video. You know what I'm saying? Those that's what pre-millennial, you know, that point of view. And that point of view is Jesus will return personally to initiate His kingdom. The saints will be raised and reign with Him on earth for a thousand years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine hundred, ninety-nine, a thousand. Okay? At the end of this time, Satan will rise up in rebellion and he will be destroyed and then the wicked will be judged and eternity will begin. That's, I mean, the, the, the premillennial view, I mean, if you saw it on a chart, it's very, very complicated. It's got all kinds of lines and squiggles and so on and so forth. You know? But basically that's, that's what it is. They actually believe there'll be a thousand years where Christ will, will reign on earth and the Jews will be brought in and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, if you haven't uh, understood already, uh, someone says, okay, Churches of Christ, well, what, wh which one do we normally hold to? And the answer would be number two, the amillennial view is what we have normally taught. However, there have been some who tried to teach premillennial, postmillennial, you know, I mean, uh, no one says that they understand everything in the book of Revelation. I haven't heard a professor or anybody, even uh, I, I mentioned a Brother North, Stafford North, probably in our brotherhood, one of the persons who've studied this book the most, written books about it and commentaries and so on and so forth. And even he says, well, the, his answer is, the amillennial view explains most of the things. Most of the things. There's still things that don't fit in the box. You know, like you take something apart, you put it back and there's still pieces left. You know what I'm saying? Not everything fits in the box, but no one says we understand everything about the book of Revelation. Okay, but in Bible study, normally you go with the explanation that answers most of the questions, because sometimes you don't have the answer to all the questions that a particular verse or passage brings up. Okay, all right, so, <clears throat> um, um, so that's the, uh, the millennial views. Uh, there are a lot of uh, interpretation uh, uh, based on the meaning of symbols and the time and the situations that the codes actually refer to. So the key to understanding and outlining the book of Revelation is to understand that the book is about the revelation of Jesus. It's not about figuring out when the end of the world is coming. It's about revealing Jesus Christ. And in the first century, it was about the revelation of Christ to the persecutors. They thought they were in charge. They thought they were the supreme power. And what John is doing in Revelation is he is you know, covertly, if you wish, revealing to the readers, you think, you think these guys have the power? Let me show you who really has the power. And he does that okay, through, through various uh, literary uh, devices. So the book of Revelation is either revealing him and his work in the history of man or revealing his word and working out of his promise to the church. So the theme of the book is Jesus Christ and the things that he has revealed that will happen. And so how do we break the book down? And I'm going to finish up with that. So there's the prologue. And in the prologue, Christ communicates with who? Well, with John. Chapter one, verse one to eight. Then a series of visions. Vision number one, Christ in the church on earth. Because what does He do? He communicates with John, then He tells John, here, this is what I want you to say to these seven churches. So Christ communicates with His church here on earth. Vision number two, vision number two is, it's very different. Now, 
he sees Christ not as he's talking to the church on earth, he sees Christ as he is in heaven. Chapter four, very long section, to chapter 16. So John describes the heavenly activity that is going on on behalf of the church. You know, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, notice the number seven? Perfect, just enough, seven. And then, um, fourth section, a third vision. Christ again, but now Christ in conquest. So you've had Christ communicating, Christ in the church on earth, Christ in heaven, now Christ the conqueror. Chapter 17 to 21. And here, again, through a series of visions, the enemy is defeated by Christ, uh, contemporary Rome, the end time, the antichrist, death itself, all these things are defeated. Fifth section, again, this time, remember it was Christ and His church on earth, now it's Christ and His church in heaven. This is what this vision is about, chapter 21 and 22. And that's the new heaven and the new earth. Remember I said to you, when Jesus comes, it's not going to be this is going to happen and in a year that's going to happen, then in a thousand years that's going to happen, then 28 days, that's, no, no, no. I've said to you before, when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ rise, those who are alive at the time of His coming join Him in the heavens, the evil are judged, the wicked one is sent to his eternal punishment, uh, the, he the heavens and the earth are destroyed, the new heavens and the earth are created, we're all with God in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. So there are no battles and boy, I wonder, I wonder when that battle's going to finish. Uh -uh. You're going to wake up, it's going to be a done deal. So what we see in the Bible is that these individual things, Peter talks about it, here John talks about it, Jesus even talks about it, in the Bible, they talk about these events taking place separately and they kind of describe them and they stretch them out so you can understand them. And that leads to the thought that perhaps these things take place in real time, you know, but no. They take place in heavenly time, boom. It's done. And so Christ and His church in heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, and then Christ and His challenge to His church, but to His church now. And that is what? Of course, obedience, reward, fellowship. The book of Revelation was not given to predict history, but rather to show the cycle of struggle and faith that the church was undergoing then and would constantly face throughout history. So when you're saying, you know, man, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, yeah. <laughs> What'd you expect? Did you expect the earth to be Christianized? No, our job isn't to Christianize the earth. Our job is to tell people, you know what? This place is going up in flames. You need to get out. You need to get out of the kingdom of darkness that you're in and come into the kingdom of light, which is the, the church of Christ, the church that belongs to Jesus. That, that's the message of the church. So let's, let's stop the hand wringing about how bad things are in the world. Uh, they're always going to be bad. That's why God, you know, authorized government, and government authorizes military and, and other things to mitigate the evil in the world, but, but, but human governments do not eliminate the evil in the world, they simply mitigate the evil in the world. Thank God that we live in a country you know, where the military is pointed towards our enemies and not towards us. Because there are a lot of countries that you know, the leaders use their own military to, to, to kill their own people. We, you know, thanks be to God, we live in a country where the enemies, excuse me, our, our people are pointed out to our enemies. But you know, it could happen. And even then we shouldn't be surprised. Maybe what I'm trying to say is, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned us because it's not going well in the world. He's telling us it's not going to go well in the world. And to be quite honest with you, you and I, our generation, we've kind of lived at a pretty nice period in history. You know, we have. Our country hasn't been attacked, there hasn't been a huge, you know, we've, we've eaten, anybody here miss a meal? 
Anybody here ever have to sleep out in the rain? Other than you hunters who do it on purpose, but other than that, you know? So we've lived in a pretty good, peaceful time, you know, because there's always wars all the time, there'll always be wars. We've been spared. So Revelation says, hey, you expect it. Then also, it was also written to ensure the reader that Christ would not abandon His church and in the end would totally save the church. Jesus Christ is not saving the world, He's saving the church. Our job is to tell that message to the world. Get out, get out. Come in to where we are. This is the safe place. Each generation can relate to this constant struggle, to the ongoing support and strength provided by Christ. And every generation has the same hope and expectation that Jesus would return to destroy evil once and for all and take the church to be with Him in heaven. I hope that happens in my lifetime. And if it doesn't, my children will hope that it'll happen in their lifetime. And now their children will hope, you know, each generation hopes that it'll happen in their lifetime. The danger is to get lost in the details of the symbols and the images and the interpretation and miss the central theme in the message of Revelation, which is assurance. God is there, God is with you. Yes, it's bad in the world, it always has been and it always will be, but rest assured, those of you who are in the church, you'll be okay. All right, that's our lesson for this time. Thank you very much for your attention.